Hello mate, thanks for clicking on this video and welcome back to the best story driven PlayStation Now games. Um, now the last video, part one, looked at the best story driven indie titles on PlayStation Now and today it's the big hitters, those AAA story driven games. Um, we're going to jump right back into it, so if you haven't seen part one, please go check that out now uh, before jumping back because you'll see nothing, nothing has changed since then. Nothing at all. Um, so, let's get into it. Yay! Spec Ops The Line is mechanically nothing more than a run-of-the-mill third-person shooter. Its setting is more unique though, a version of Dubai caught in unrelenting sandstorms, the severity of which brings Walker and his squad into the city to rescue survivors. Despite your good intentions, most interactions end in gunfire, usually due to a lack of trust and communication between you and civilians. Player-driven choices underpin situations, usually a case of choosing who to save. You witness the toll it takes on Walker himself, but the consequences of your actions rarely surface, which kind of stopped me from reflecting on anything I'd done. It's not a long campaign and it isn't perfect, but it touches on enough interesting plot devices to break off from 90% of other military shooters, and I commend it for that. Like the name suggests, Oddworld takes place in a truly bizarre Wild West. You're the bounty hunter Stranger, who brings criminals like Filthy Hands Floyd and Fatty McBoomBoom Boom to justice. His weapon of choice is a double barrel crossbow that takes live ammo like chipunks, thud slugs and fuzzles. You heal by smacking your body so vigorously it looks like it could be a Fortnite dance and at one point a chicken called me a filthy turd. Oh, stinky turd. Sorry, it was stinky. The brilliant strangeness of Oddworld distracts you from the game's slow opening, yo-yoing between the bounty store and bandit hideouts. But the narrative is powered by Stranger and the supporting cast, rather than the places you go. There are the usual western story beats of betrayal and redemption, but they're delivered with surprising grit considering I spend most of the time talking to chicken farmers. No, sorry, chicken farmers exist. These are farmer chickens, and I much prefer them. Metro Exodus just joined PS Now, and having played the other two, this was my chance to complete the trilogy. Exodus differs from 2033 and Last Light, as Artyom and the Order finally venture onto Russia's surface, away from the underground tunnels of previous games. The survival busy work remains. You now need to clean dirt from your gun, as well as wipe your mask and replace gas mask filters, but that maintenance ups the immersion without feeling tiresome. Exodus makes great use of a more open setting, exploring rivers, swamplands and forests, and distinguishes itself by injecting some much needed optimism. Unlike the first two games, which are great in their own right, Exodus is the first to suggest that there might be a light at the end of the tunnel. Prey's story owes a lot to its setting. The Talos One is a hybrid of space age and art deco, a beautiful backdrop for problem solving, sleuthing and piecemeal storytelling. Prey's overarching plot is typical for the sci-fi genre. A hostile alien species called the Typhon have breached a space station and have a rather annoying habit of mimicking any object in sight. Moving through Talos One is a bit of a nail biter where any object could be an alien in disguise, but that's the least of your worries. Morgan Yu's reality is shattered within Prey's opening moments, immediately setting the tone for what follows. You really can't trust anyone on this space station. You must find answers for yourself, and how much you uncover is totally up to you. Prey lends a hand by offering several inventive ways to do that. The usual terminal hacking, picking locks, and listening to audio logs are still here, but to really understand what's happening, and more importantly, why it's happening, you'll need to get creative like tracking staff whereabouts through their online ID, or morphing into a cup to shimmy through a gap, or my personal favorite, using this seemingly useless foam dart gun to access out of reach areas. There are a range of interesting melodramas to uncover on Talos One, each more rewarding the harder they are to find. Eco is a young boy imprisoned by shadowy creatures in a cavernous castle. As he searches for an escape, he finds another captive, Yorda, and despite speaking different languages, their connection is immediately clear and their bond grows stronger as they try to escape. Eco kinda looks and sounds like a prolonged escort mission, especially when a core gameplay mechanic is holding Yorda's hand to guide her to safety. But it's a very intimate feature, feeling the controller rumble gently as you pull her along behind you. It is, in truth, uh, a simple story, 
but it's a story that conveys very complex emotions. Solitude, companionship, loss, sadness and sacrifice, all the more impressive given the era this was made. I could put Fumito Ueda's other classic Shadow of the Colossus on here as well, of course, but I've already spoken about it in depth, so go check that out if you want to. 2013 was inundated with post-apocalyptic settings. Zombies were everywhere, and many of us, myself included, had lost our appetite for them. The Last of Us is set 20 years after a fungal disease brings society to its knees, leaving only its bitter remains. Joel is the player protagonist whose personal loss has ground him into a hard-nosed, borderline unlikable dude. Ellie has also formed a tough exterior, but still acts like a real teenage girl, and proves to be Joel's catharsis. These are familiar motifs, and The Last of Us's thematic design is so effective that it can become draining, to be honest. I couldn't bring myself to play for more than a couple of hours at a time. But while everything around them rots, Ellie and Joel's relationship blooms backed with fantastic voice acting and direction. The Last of Us starts slow and doesn't even really build to a climax, but its two leads grow with real patience and skill. In my last video, I said how story-driven indies rely on mystique to tell their story and engage the player. Control is a AAA game that does the same. That sense of intrigue is immediately gripping, but Control doesn't have the ethereal charm that, say, Journey does. The story isn't open to interpretation, Rather, it's so bonkers that it's hard just to keep up with what's going on. To briefly set the scene, Jesse stumbles, through no clear intent of her own, into the oldest house, an otherworldly energy that's currently acting as a building and the home of the Federal Bureau of Control. The FBC is led by the director, who's not as high up in the hierarchy as the role suggests. He is guided by the board, a voice from the astral plane. That is, until, for some reason that I won't explain, because spoilers, the role of the director finds its way to you. There's also an evil force possessing FBC staff and manipulating the very walls of the oldest house, and you get some mysterious powers of your own and start figuring it all out. I don't want to say it anymore because this is absolutely a game you want to experience firsthand. Even then, you might not have a clue what's going on. It's one where you don't have to read all the collectible bits and pieces, but it definitely helps. I know some people don't like that, which is fair enough, but surely we can all appreciate that you can pick up filing cabinets and hurl them at people. In any case, Control leaves on the 28th of August, so there's really not much time left. So go, go download Control right now on your PlayStation 4, and then come back because I'll miss you. But go, go right now. I mentioned the danger of creating film-like experiences in games in part one, but Naughty Dog have mastered the process. The Uncharted games are extremely linear, asking you to steer Nathan Drake through cinematic environments and grandiose action cutscenes. You don't do anything other than run, jump and clamber in the direction Naughty Dog tells you to, but damn if it isn't a load of fun. Shit. Uncharted offers a more movie-like experience than The Last of Us, for me, because its adrenaline-pumping adventure segments feel straight out of Hollywood. The third game pushes that to the extreme, but it's the second, A Thief's End, that combines action with a cinema-worthy story. This is a true adventure film in game form, a search for ancient relics backed more by greed than historical research. It's a staggered treasure hunt, following a pattern of fight your way to a clue, realise that clue has already been taken, or maybe you get double-crossed. Or maybe it's just the clue to another clue, which Nathan will then crack with impressive speed and ease. Here we are. Now we just gotta find the right temple. Well, that may be easier said than done. No, tell me about it. Maybe we can... Oh, bingo. And then it's on to the next part of the trail. It's nothing you haven't seen before, but sometimes a standard adventure story is perfectly good enough. I mean, that's why it stood the test of time in Hollywood. That's not to say Uncharted lacks substance. Drake is more than the archetypal action hero, with real flaws that surface over time. And it's not until playing these games on PS Now that I can appreciate Uncharted's story, and I'm left surprised and impressed at how well-crafted the characters are. It's just a shame I didn't get on PlayStation Now early enough to play Uncharted 4 and complete the saga, but what are you gonna do? The original Bioshock is probably my favorite story-driven game ever. But more importantly, it laid the blueprint for how to spin a compelling, mature narrative into a genre that is about shooting all the stuff until there's no stuff left. 
Rapture rests on the brink of collapse, the cracks running far deeper than the building's exterior. What little beauty is left is drowned out by its mutated citizens that will do anything for just a drop more Adam. You're forced to wander through it all, following the mysterious voice of Atlas and try- <laughs> Can't br I can't hold those back, and trying to understand the civil war that truly sunk the city. For about 12 hours you learn of Andrew Ryan and Frank Fontaine, the struggle of the city not knowing who to believe until, well, until it's far too late. Of course, you all know that, because who hasn't played Bioshock at this point? You all know the story, you all know the twist. It's like how Darth Vader being Luke's father lost its impact because now it's common knowledge. But that first playthrough, my mind melted. Many games have gone on to question player morality and the illusion of choice in video games. Bioshock was the first to do it to me and remains the most memorable. Then there's Bioshock 2, which is more of a mixed bag. It's definitely a better game from a gameplay standpoint, but few people hold it in the same light as Bioshock or Infinite, and for good reason. As a work of fiction, it isn't anywhere near the caliber of the this other two. But the multiplayer was pretty fun, and the Minerva's Den DLC was better than the actual campaign. Bioshock Infinite replaced the political ambiguity of Rapture with a hyper-religious cult vibe introduced Elizabeth, who would win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress if video games had such awards, and had another great twist in its tale. Infinite brings the trilogy full circle, and I mean full circle in a literal sense. Bioshock and Infinite are inextricably tied. Spoilers if you haven't played either of these games, but you know I did just spoil the shit out of Bioshock 1, so you may as well stick with me at this point. Constants and variables. What? There's always a lighthouse. There's always a man, there's always a city. But the similarities go much, much deeper. There's also always a ruler of that city with brilliant ideals and a terrifying ego. There's always a leader that deals the city its killing blow. There's always a scientist that helped create the city and helps you fulfill your destiny. There's always a girl, always a protector, and there's always a man that never truly knows if they have control over their actions. So if that's not a statement for how a game can be driven by its story, I don't know what is. Um, the story is the most memorable part of Bioshock for me, and I think it's perfect for an, the narrative triple A genre. What I did notice going through while well, making this video is that a lot of these games are PS3 titles. Um, in fact, the only PS4 ones are Prey, um, Control, and the new Metro Exodus, and maybe the other two, I can't remember exactly. Um, but most of them are PS3 games, and obviously if you're on PS4, um, you can only stream PS3 games, same for PC obviously, but if your net internet connection isn't that good you can't really experience those PS3 titles which is a shame because that makes up, having done these videos I've realised that that makes a big chunk of the PS Now library because I guess because you have these classic PS3 games from the previous genre and you don't really have those for PS4 yet because it's current gen um, and it's just a shame because games like The Last of Us have a remastered version on the PS4 that Sony obviously for whatever reason, probably because people still buy that game, um, they won't put it on the service. Um, and games like Uncharted 4 I've missed out on and I'm sure a lot of other people have because they put it for this constricted time on there. So I'm going to, I think in my next video, I'm going to cover PS Now streaming capability, basically what my experience has been like it and where I think Sony could and hopefully will take the streaming side of it because at the moment I've read on, on Reddit and stuff that a lot of people have had a bit of trouble with streaming and obviously because it depends on your internet connection, um, different people are going to have different experiences. So look out for that video next. Uh, thanks so much for watching guys and I guess finally we should address the elephant in the room or the elephant on my head. And uh, the truth of it is that I've actually it's all a ruse. Um, I've been practicing my Adobe Premiere color grading and this uh, this is actually just a trick of the light. So um, I just thought, what would it be like to have blonde hair on video? So I just did this, um, but you know, I can make it pink, uh, blue and other stuff. Um, and now it's back to my normal hair color. So. Don't worry if you thought that I'd actually just gone and dyed my hair blonde as some kind of, you know, sign of a breakdown. 
because that's not that's not me i'm i'm doing good um thanks for watching and um i'll see you on the next one goodbye send help Thank you.